This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. There are so many topics we cover here, and this one is gonna be really interesting because it's an advance and something that's very cool at the same time. And we're talking about how imaging can help the neurosurgeon, how imaging can help the surgeon altogether in what they're doing. And we're gonna explain all of those terms to you in a second, but first I wanna introduce our guest, Dr. Clark Chen, welcome. Thank you for having me here. Dr. Chen is co-director of neurosurgical oncology and vice chair now of the Department of Neurosurgery uh, here at UC San Diego. Uh, in the uh, Department of Academic Affairs, that's right. For Academic Affairs, and so uh, this is your, your baby now of, of using imaging to help the surgeon. Specifically, I think we're for MRI now. That's right. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about what an MRI is and then how we're turning it into a tool for the surgeon instead of just a thing to look at stuff. The MRI is a way for us to visualize the internal organs within our body without giving the body radiation. The basic principle is that there are certain movements in water that can be measured, and when they, when they move in a particular way, they emit actually a radio frequency. And by reconstructing that frequency, I could see exquisite anatomies within your brain, within your heart, within your muscles. The magnet aligns the water, That's and right. then when the water's let go, it releases Precisely. it. Precisely, that's, that's exactly uh, how it works. And, and so you're able to get uh, a level of resolution that is almost godlike. <laughs> it's, it feels to me, in well, my career in medicine, the advance has been unbelievable. It, it, in many ways, you're right. It, it's like staring in the face of God, because by, by looking and reconstructing the water molecule movements, we can see exquisite connections between neurons that we cannot otherwise see unless we're performing a, a dissection on a real specimen. So the MRI actually allows us to visually reconstruct all the beautiful anatomy that we spent years and years studying as medical students, as physicians. Now, by doing the right type of sequences, the right type of images, we could actually see that without in any way touching the patient. It is extraordinary, you're right. Does it feel like magic a little bit to you or that you're, you're so familiar with the science that you appreciate the technologic and scientific advances? Well, it, it's, what it is is almost as if it's a, there's a marriage between the art and the science, right? The science beautiful, the fact that we can measure the frequency of wave relief by water molecules and reconstruct it in such a beautifully and atomically accurate way, uh, to me it's an art. So. so I want you to talk now about what you do in your real life job uh, when you go to operate on someone. And then I wanna marriage those two concepts of what you do and then how that incredible technology of the MRI, what you can do by putting those two together. So in your real life, when you go, you, you know, we, just before we started the show, we, you know, you're gonna probably when we're done, go to an operation. That's right. And, and so what is it that you do when you put on your doctor hat, your surgeon hat? Well, I'm trained as a clinical neurosurgeon and within neurosurgery, it's becoming increasingly specialized like many other medical special, med medicine uh, fields in medicine. And my specialty within neurosurgery is neuro-oncology. And so I operate most on patients who's been afflicted with brain cancers, various forms of brain cancers. And one of the major challenges when you're trying to remove a tumor in the brain is that you're trying to actually avoid harm to the patient. For example, if you have a tumor that's sort of deeper in the brain, you have to go through some normal brain in order to remove the tumor. And the question is, what is the best approach to get to the tumor, 
right? If you have a tumor here, is it best to come straight down, coming in at an angle, coming horizontally? And the answer to that question is it depends on where the connections are that mediates the function of the patient. You would never want to, for example, in trying to remove a tumor, to intersect and go through a fiber, right? Because when you go right through, the fiber is disconnected. Cut. And well, if you don't have the cables connected, the function's lost. Whereas if you know what the orientation of the fibers are, you could actually come in and at an angle so you pa you're parallel to the fiber and splay it open, and that minimizes the amount of injury. And so the marriage between the ability to see these connections and the ability um, to plan my surgery based upon these connections, these things called tracks, is really, really helpful in terms of performing a better surgery for my patients. So up till now, you would get this um, I, would, I would call it almost a map, you know, on the MRI, and you would, you would take that map and you might bring it into the operating room to help guide you as you go, but to me it's almost like a driver trying to look at a map while you're driving. What if you put those together and you have a GPS that's talking to you or you're in the middle of the surgery, you're getting instant feedback, and that would be doing the operation inside the MRI scanner. That is absolutely right, that's absolutely right. And we are beginning to do that right now and we will be doing more and more of that. And one of the major challenges is exactly as what you described is that the brain actually shifts. The brain is a dynamic entity and as you manipulate it, as you remove tumor, it shifts based upon what you've done. And so in some situations it's actually very helpful to be able to take a real image of the brain as it stands rather than as it was. Right, your position now is different from, your physical position is different now yes. than what it was three minutes ago, and the brain's no different. And huh. so the ability to eventually do these surgeries in the MRI will be extraordinarily helpful in terms of maximizing the utility of these technologies. Tell me what you're doing to get there. Well, we're, the, as a first step, what we're doing right now is we are taking the preoperative image, the one the static picture that you're talking about, and we are fusing it with the tracks that we visualize. And by doing that, we could plan our trajectory in a way that allows us to get into the tumor. Currently, all we have the capacity to do is to marriage these, marry these two technology by fusing them onto a, a GPS system that we call neural navigation. By now doing that, we're setting the platform for in the future someday in the operating room, doing that in real time. So tell me about the neural navigation. How does that look? How does it work? The neural navigation works by, in the following way. Essentially, you um, take the surface of the patient's face, all right? So when you take an MRI, you could reconstruct the patient's face. And then what you could do is register the internal anatomy of the patient's brain, the tumor, and all its various parts relative to the patient's face. And by doing so, we could then use that to navigate and tell me where the tumor is in the brain and only excise or operate in the region that's in proximity to the tumor. Yeah, I mean, that's just astonishing. It's, it's terrific technology. Um, as you know, I'm an ophthalmologist, and we use registration techniques to understand where the location of the eye is for laser procedures and other things. It, it's an unbelievable use of the technology uh, and, and brilliant, um, but you don't, always operate, sometimes you have to deliver material to a tumor. Does this help you in that process? It does, it does. It helps us in, in a couple of different ways. And you're right, there's certain tumors that are not amenable to surgery. That is the harm of doing an open surgery, going through the normal brains, um, outweighs any potential benefit. Consider the following, right? It's estimated that we have set more than hundreds of billions or trillions of neural connections in your brain. And every centimeter we go through, we destroy more of these connections than people, there are people in the world, <laughs> right? So there are certain tumors that we just should not be doing an open surgery on. And in those situations, what we can do is to use the MRI and in real time to guide us in terms of inserting um, either catheter or a laser probe into the area of the tumor. And then we could use either the catheter to deliver drugs or 
viruses or other things that would kill the tumor, or use the laser probe to heat up the tumor in a way as to ablate it. So the MRI technology allows us not only to help define how to get to the tumor, but in some situations, treat tumors that cannot otherwise be treated. And there are times when I, I would guess that you may not be sure which of one or two or three types of tumor this could be because they That's look right. similarly. That's right. Does this help you do a biopsy without, dis without disturbing all the tissue or That's diminishing a it? That's a very, very, very important point. In certain situations, the first step, well, not in certain situations, in all situations, the first step in treating a tumor is to find out what kind of tumor it is. And this is sometimes a very challenging proposition. The way the biopsy is done today is that we, again, register the various features, facial features relative to the tumor, and then we insert a needle based upon that calculation into what we think is the tumor, and we take a biopsy. There is no way for me to visually validate that my needle is actually in the place it's supposed to be. Uh, it's really a blind procedure where we are using, as you said, these registration tools to get to where we're supposed to be. Now, you can imagine if there's a subtle error or if there's you know, minor mishaps, you may not be precisely where you are, but there's no way for me to know that. Now, by actually doing the biopsy in the MRI, I can visualize precisely where my needle tip is located. More importantly, one of the major challenges of doing these biopsies is I always worry that maybe as I'm doing the biopsy, I'm causing some form of bleeding or hemorrhage, and I can't see it. The skull is opaque. So by doing this, the biopsy actually in the MRI, I can, right I, can, I know right away what's happening. And if there's no hemorrhage, and the pathologist needs more specimens, and I know I'm precisely where I need to be, I could take more specimens. Now, doing, I've done hundreds of procedures in the traditional way where it's really an opaque process. And there are a number, a handful of times when I just really wish I know where I am. Sure. You take a specimen, you send it to the pathologist, and they're not sure. They say, well, we'll take another yeah. one. And I say, well, gosh, I, I, I wish I know where I am so I could adjust where my biopsy is. Well, by doing the surgery actually within the MRI, we avoid that. Now, there are a lot of technological advances that's required in order for us to do surgeries in the MRI. Well, uh, you know, I, I, when I operate, I have metal equipment. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You can't in an MRI. You cannot. You cannot. The MRI, as you mentioned, is just one big magnet, right? It's there to align the water molecules in a certain way and measure certain frequencies of wavelength or, or electromagnetic wave that's released. So what had to be developed was ways for us to, uh, number one, have instruments that are non-metallic. And also for us to interface with the images in real time using computer algorithms so that we can visualize precisely where we are at all times. So it requires a really integrated set of systems, computer software, hardware, as well as surgical equipment so that we can actually operate in the MRI. I'm almost imagining Google Glass where it's being you know, <laughs> holographically projected onto your eye while you're working onto, on the patient That's coming. at the same time. That's coming. Yeah, and so you describe a setup that to me can't be available everywhere. No, it's not. It's not. It, it really requires a dedicated uh, MRI that is also used as an operating room. I'll give you an example. For now, when I do these surgeries, I have to do the surgery in an MRI, and that MRI is only available on certain dates of the week because they're also used for diagnostic purposes. Well, but an OR has to be sterile and has to have other certain requirements, et cetera. How, how many of those exist? Well, within the San Diego, Southern California area, UCSD has the only one. And so um, it is quite an expensive endeavor, but it is an endeavor that will help us ensure the safety of our patients. And I think UCSD has made the commitment to that endeavor. In fact, uh, in 2016, when the Jacob Medical Centers opened up, there will be a dedicated operating room with an MRI embedded within. How excited are you about that? I am, you know, I'm more excited for my patients. I think that, you know, you know, when you're limited by technology, occasionally you feel that you want the technology here today because you want to do your best for the patients. Uh, unfortunately, these kind of infrastructures take time. So I'm very excited that, that we at UCSD will be able to help our patients in ways that no one else can using the technology and the setup that we have. I have to ask you about this. You mentioned it's expensive. You mentioned that you can't wait for it to get here. 
We're living in an era where cost effectiveness is becoming a byword. We have, uh, the government has gotten very involved in healthcare. Are, are we gonna find where some, somebody's gonna say this is too expensive? Are insurance companies not gonna pay for it? Is this gonna be restricted? How do we, how do we combine advances in medicine with cost effectiveness and, and continue to plow forward along the way? Well, that's a very challenging proposition. Now, um, I think that it is a fact that the government is regulating more of the process. And I could tell you that for a large number of the treatments that we're doing, uh, it is done as a collaboration. Uh, for instance, we have a collaboration with a local firm, Tokajin, where they develop viruses that will selectively destroy tumors and it is with their support that we are able to pay for the expenses associated with treating patients because they're sponsoring clinical trials. And that clinical trial is at no cost to the patient and at no cost to the government. And so one of the ways that we have to be able to do very skillfully is to find partners who are willing to help us in this endeavor. And as we establish the efficacy, as we document that the surgery is better than not having the MRI or not doing the surgery in the MRI, I think our government is composed of in-line leaders that if we provide them with genuine data, unequivocally demonstrating benefit, that they too would want to support the technology because ultimately one of their friends or relatives may be affected yeah, with the uh, disease. <laughs> Tokajin's looking at uh, astrocytomas or glioblastomas. That's right. Uh, I have a cousin who passed away from that. I'm sorry. Uh, and um, they've tried to raise money to help, but this is real. This touches people's lives. And here you are advancing the equipment that, that people might live. We might, we might take people who would have otherwise died and make them live. Uh, I don't know what number you put on that or how you put a number on it, but it's important that you be able to continue that work. Absolutely, and, and for many reasons. Patience for us as physicians comes number one, right? For us, one patient saved is enough. Certainly the government has additional considerations, but for them there's also the consideration of maintaining an intellectual leadership within the medical field. And that should be a major impetus because if we do not continue to invest in technologies, in helping our patients, what will ultimately happen is that we will concede our leadership or intellectual leadership in medical sciences. And I don't think on a policy level that would, is something that's attractive. So for many reasons, I, I think the government with all its restrictions has a vested interest in helping us develop this. But that said, the resources are becoming more scarce. And so within academia, it is our responsibility to reach out to whatever resources are available, philanthropy, collaboration with industry, NIH funding, whatever resources, we should do everything we can to garner those resources to provide the data that is required to make this a standard of care. Well, when I hear you talk, I think here's a, a physician who is relentlessly gonna pursue the best possible options for his patients, and that, that you will not tolerate not being able to do that, that, that you will insist on always being able to provide the best, which means that UC San Diego will be continuing to provide the best care. And this is, it's true of all my colleagues. I mean, this is why we have a shared academic mission, right? We're here uh, to define the medicine of tomorrow. And the only way to, the, to do that is to have a conviction, to have a strategy, and to care. So talk to me for a moment about the value of clinical trials. It is really the only way for us to advance our standard of care for our patients. In my specialty, it is not unusual to encounter patients who've exhausted all options, all options as we currently know it. And clinical trials is really the only reasonable way to advance our understanding in a way as to help that patient and the many more patients to come. How do we know if a certain therapy the tocogen therapy, the laser therapy, how do we know if they're gonna work? How do we know that the effects that we're seeing is not patient specific? We have to have a sufficient number of patients identically treated, identically, identically selected, so that we can make a genuine comparison. Now, I'm not advocating a situation where every minor detail has to undergo a trial. I mean, it goes, it stands to reason that if you jump out of an airplane without a parachute, 
Yeah, you're not going to do very happen. well. Right. But there are critical questions in which we don't have a definitive answer like that. And in that situation, the trials are absolutely critical. And so, you know, I, I, I admire the, the, the strength and the character of our patients who enroll themselves in clinical trials because by very definition, the trial implies we don't know if it works. As an investigator in a trial, you essentially have equipoise where you think that you're, you're looking at two treatments, either one of which might be, be better, and you're not sure which one. We, we, that's right. That's so right. if you were sure, you wouldn't put your patient through that's that. Right. That's right. That's right. And, and so the patient's getting the opportunity to maybe get a better treatment, but at the very least, their doctor thinks that they're, they possibly could be equal. That's right. And it takes a, a, a tremendous amount of courage right, to subject yourself into that uncertainty. Yes, I might be getting the standard of care, I might be getting something better, but that better may also come at a cost, and we don't know. So these trials are eminently important for us to resolve these issues, and it's the only way we could define the future standard of care. And, and the, the current standard of care was defined by yesterday's trials. That's right. Let me give you an example. For example, right now we are treating a number of patients using the laser probes that I was talking to you about for tumors that we cannot get to with an open surgery, what we're doing is we're inserting a laser probe into the tumor and we are, uh, we're, we're heating it up in real time. And what's really cool, here's really another thing that you find, you'll find very interesting. Not only can you visualize internal anatomies within a patient using an MRI, you could actually measure the temperature <laughs> of a patient using an MRI. And so what we can do is use this laser probe to go in and then we can heat up the tumor and monitor where the heat's created in real time. It's called MR thermometry. And we can then use that, the laser to sculpt the tumor, uh, the heat in a way as to destroy the tumor without hurting the brain. Now, how do we know that actually works? How do we know that's good for the patient? Well, it's only because people have done studies, right? And these studies have passed the scrutiny of our our FDA, our, our regulatory commissions, to the point they say, okay, this works. Go ahead and use it to treat patients. Right. Right. So the only way we had this laser treatment was because it's really the culmination of lots of brilliant physicists figuring out how to measure temperatures using MRI, right? Brilliant engineers engineering a, a laser probe onto a small catheter. Brilliant physicists who could reconstruct the human brain, the tracks and all the tumor all the engineers who made all the equipment that's necessary to actually do the surgery with MRI. And now, all these modalities have surpassed the expectations of our regulatory agencies, and now we have this tool. Right? Incredible. And so by doing more trials today, tomorrow we'll have more tools like the laser. So where are we going next? We, have, we talked about the MRI, we've talked about some of the lasers. Where, where are you taking us next? Well, it's not me taking, you know, it's really the needs of the patients. And everything that I do is really driven by how we could treat our patients better. I think that for viral therapy, for example, it is important to understand which patients will benefit most, right? Right now, for a tumor that's, see that's seated deeply in the brain, we could either treat it with an oncolytic virus or we could treat it with a laser probe. Well, which one's better? Who would benefit from what? We need to realize today, and more and more, and this is, is, is also a, a major direction for the cancer center here at UCSD, we're understanding every tumor is not the same. An individual who lives in San Diego is not the same individual who lives in South Africa, in Japan, in uh, Germany. They have different habits, different genetics, and so we need to understand what all the tumors are genetically and to match that genetic profile to the kind of treatment that we give them. We need to understand ultimately who would be the best person to have a laser treatment, who would be the best person to have a, a, uh, you know, a viral injection, who would be the best person to get certain drugs versus not getting certain drugs, who would be the best patient to, to go after the surgery of uh, the tumor aggressively, who not, right? If I know for a fact that there is a drug that will melt the tumor away, if I know that, and if I know that tumor is of that type, there is no reason for me to subject a patient to surgery. I would do a biopsy and have the patient treat it. And there, but there may be times when you're going to do a surgical reduction of the size of the tumor That's and then right. heat what's left over and That's give right. the last bit That's of it right. a virus. That's right. You know, and, and use some combination of all these modalities. Absolutely. So, so the future lies in developing new technologies that will have, give us more chest moves against the tumor. 
right? Ultimately, I like to think of treatment of a patient, a cancer patient, as a series of chess moves. And by understanding the consequences of each move, you can better play the game. By having more moves available to you, you can better play the game. And so that's where uh, the future lies. And it seems like here we're, we're, we're trading pawns in for queens. So you, have, you have better and stronger actors on that, on that chess board. Absolutely. And we don't even know what all the moves are on your opponent's side in terms of cancer. We're finding out more and more every day. So the future of, of not just oncology, but medicine in general, is really to personalize our treatment based upon everything that we understand about the individual, about the disease, and about the treatment modalities. I'm gonna give you the ultimate power in the last couple of minutes we have left in the show. What do you see the world according to Chen? Where should we go in medicine? What would you like to see in the next five or 10 years going forward? Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a tall order. Um, I, I, I would like, um, if there's one thing that I would wish for today, that would be that we could accelerate the process of drug discovery accelerate the process of the approval process. In the tumor that I treat, uh, glioblastomas, there are really only three drugs out there. Um, and that one of them is radiation. We really need to have more moves on our chessboard. And if every, every drug takes 20 years to develop, I'm not going to see a meaningful impact in my patients. So we need to somehow balance the risks of an overzealous individual who is selling snake oil, right? There are plenty of folks out there who claims cure, but the reality is the data doesn't justify those, at least as far as I know. We want to safeguard against that, and that's an absolute necessity. We also need to pay heed to the fact that our patients are dying every day, and that every delay that's unnecessary is ethically and morally unacceptable. So somewhere in that is a balance, and I, I frankly don't know precisely where that balance is, but the feel, the intuitive feel is that, that it's biased toward the side of things going slow, or on the side of things going more slowly. Now, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that we, you know, part of the answer has to be in the enrollment of patients in trials and in the intelligent design of trials. We cannot have trials that ends up with equivocal answers. And, no that, and, right. and that, that also is unacceptable ethically. So my ideal world is for everyone to come together to develop a way that we could explore new technology in a financially solvent and financially responsible way to explore that in a rationally sound way so that we could get to a point where we could help our patients better. Boy, am I glad you're out there. I'm glad you're on the side of the patient, advocating for them, taking care of them, and fighting for them to move this all forward. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Well, thank you again for having me. Well, you've been listening to Dr. Chen talk to you about some of the advances that are going on in neurosurgery. It is unbelievably cool that we have these things happening now, that you can think about doing surgery inside of an MRI unit and be able to precisely protect the brain and deliver medications or remove it with surgery. We are living in a world that sounds like science fiction, but with your help, with the help of funding from the government, philanthropy, partnering with uh, industry, we're gonna get there because we have people like Dr. Chen who are not gonna rest until we do. I hope you've been listening carefully because once again, knowledge is power. I'm Dr. David Granite and this is Health Matters.